Hello, everyone. I'm Michael Coletti, Partner and Manufacturing and Distribution Practice Leader here at Mazars in the US. Thank you for joining our economic update that Mazars is proudly co-sponsoring with, with the National Association of Manufacturers and their Chief Economist, Dr. Chad Moutre. Mazars is a high-performing national firm with significant presence in strategic US geographies. Our dedicated professionals have technical industry expertise to develop customized solutions for clients that, that create value and optimize their performance. We deliver dedicated groups of industry specialists providing tax, accounting, and advisory to growth-oriented enterprises and individuals. Our culture of diversity, collaboration, and community is driven by our guiding principles of association, respect, and excellence. Mazars has long benefited from being a member of NAM. NAM represents roughly 14,000 member companies from small businesses to large global leaders in every industrial sector, serving as the nation's most influential advocate for manufacturers and distributors across the country. Dr. Moutre serves as NAM's economic forecaster and spokesperson on economic issues. He frequently comments on current economic conditions for manufacturers through professional presentations and media interviews and has appeared on various news outlets. In addition, he is the director of the Center for Manufacturing Research at the Manufacturing Institute, the workforce development and education partner of NAM, where he leads efforts to produce thought leadership, data, and analysis of relevance to the business leaders in the sector. During our webinar today, Chad, will lead a discussion on the U.S. and global economic forecast. The webinar will highlight current manufacturing trends and the outlook for 2023. Chad will also cover results of NAM's recent outlook survey, which illustrates manufacturers' concerns about the challenging economic environment characterized by inflation, supply chain disruption, and the workforce crisis. With that said, Chad, I'm going to hand the mic over to you. Thank you. There we go. Thank, thank you, uh, Michael. It's uh, always fun to uh, uh, talk about the economy. Hopefully, everyone's having a great afternoon. And I'm going to share my screen here. So hopefully, everyone can see that. Uh, and uh, as, as, as was mentioned, I am the chief economist at the National Association of Manufacturers. Been at the NAM actually for 12 years. Uh, before that, I was chief economist at the U.S. Small Business Administration. So I've been in D.C. for 20 years, um, uh, and I, uh, I straddle over into the Manufacturing Institute, uh, where I run the Center for Manufacturing Research. So we'll talk a little bit about um, workforce issues. I suspect today, and so I would expect maybe some of you might have questions about that. So we can, we can handle that in the Q and A. Um, before I, I start to the first slide here, I'm just going to give quite a, a, a quick overview of what I'm seeing. Because um, it, it, it is a bit more of a mixed bag, I think, than, than folks uh, might recognize, right? So, yes, there's a lot of uh, negative news out there, right? So, you know, we certainly have seen manufacturing end last year on a disappointing note. Uh, and you'll see some data on that with regard to manufacturing production. Uh, we've had a lot of sentiment surveys that have drifted into ne negative territory for several months, right? Uh, and, and there's still a lot of worry out there about the overall economic outlook, uh, and, and, and certainly folks are talking about whether we would have a recession this year or not, right? And so there, there is that issue. But at the same time, I think it's all important to note that uh, it's not all bad, right? Uh, and, and the reality is that manufacturing employment is still very robust, right? The overall labor market continues to be strong. Wage growth continues to be strong. Uh, and we still see these pockets of resilience in the economy that that I think are, are notable. Uh, and, and a little bit of a spoiler alert before I get to the slides here. I still think that that uh, a soft landing is possible this year, right? And so while there is worry about a recession, uh, I do think that that it's certainly possible that uh, we can avoid one, which would be 
Fantastic. So now that we've done that, and we, we can almost end here, Michael. I've already given a spoiler alert, right? But I, but I won't. I won't. We'll go through uh, the slides here. Uh, again, you have my 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 Twitter handle on there. If, if you're an NAM member, uh, you also might get my Monday Economic Report. If, if that's something that interests you, you can always reach out to me on that. So um, let's go to the first uh, first slide here, which is the uh, before mentioned. Uh, there it is. Okay, uh, NAM Manufacturers Outlook Survey. Uh, and, and, and full disclosure, this actually is in the field right now, right? So we, if you are an NAM member, um, uh, you you could potentially be filling this out, right? And so we we will be getting new data for the for the first quarter uh, in in the next couple of weeks. Here we'll be releasing that, uh, but you can see in December uh, that uh, you know we fell a little bit below the historic average in terms of where manufacturers are in terms of their overall outlook. Uh, you can see that at any given time over the last 25 years, uh, three quarters of our members are positive, either somewhat or very positive, right? Uh, and you can see the, the the three recessions that are highlighted on, on this chart, right? And so, um, uh, again, lots of volatility over that time period. Uh, more recently, obviously, 69% uh, of our members were positive about their company's outlook in December. Uh, that's down 20 percentage points from where they were at this point last year, right? Uh, and, and not a shock there why why that's the case. Uh, you know, obviously last February was the Russian invasion of Ukraine, so that certainly impacted confidence. Uh, we've had supply chain issues, inflationary issues, uh, worries about a recession, right? Uh, uh, just a whole host of things have really happened to kind of uh, bring that figure down a little bit. Um, this number is in the field now. I don't. It's still early, so I, I wouldn't want to venture to say where that number will go moving forward. Uh, but but you can stay stay tuned uh, for that. Um, I think the one interesting thing, and this is something that I, I've been talking about in the press quite a bit, because everyone wants to talk about the fact that the ISM uh, surveys are in, they have been negative for, for three straight months. Um, but I think it's important to note that while while manufacturing activity has slowed, and you're certainly seeing some weaker activity kind of across the board for a lot of from a, for a lot of our sectors, when we ask for folks about the next 12 months, those numbers are not negative. Um, uh, and so I, you know, what I what I've liked likened to tell to all the press, especially when they're talking to me about this, is, is uh, I do not think manufacturing is in a recession, despite the kind of this desire for folks to say that we are. <laughs> um, largely because employment growth is still strong. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And because expectations are still positive, right? I, I've been at this role long enough to remember when expectations were negative. Uh, and that's not where we are at this particular point. Uh, and you can see that in December, uh, expected growth for sales and production and capital spending were, were over 2%. Uh, again, well below where it was this time last year. Uh, and, and I wouldn't, again, be shocked if, if when we release the first quarter data, if that number pulls back uh, even further from that figure. Uh, but but yet, I think it, it, it is important to kind of highlight that kind of distinction that's out there. Uh, the number one issue <clears throat> for our members, uh, and again, I, I travel around the country. I was just in Atlanta a couple of days ago uh, and just trying to meet with members as much as I can. Everywhere I go, everyone says they're having trouble finding work. So that that is the number one issue. Uh, in the preliminary data that I've seen for the first quarter, it's still the number one issue, right? Um, so that those are all, uh, you know, uh, that's that's a it's, it's a tight labor market. So uh, companies are really scrambling for where they're going to find workers. But you can see the supply chain and and inflation are still up there, right? Each of those measures are getting more than sixty percent of our response respondents saying it's a it's a primary challenge. But those numbers, you know, a, a, a have fallen down a little bit. At one point, uh, supply chain was number one. At one point this year. In the last year, inflation was number one, uh, and so they've moved down the list a little bit to be in second, third place. Uh, yet, for many members, it's still uh, it, it, those are significant challenges. <clears throat> On the supply chain side, uh, so first of all, I'll tell you what the what the survey said in December, but but then I'll, I'll, I'll kind of caveat a little bit with with the news that I think that these numbers are actually better uh, since then, uh, which is that you know sixty percent of our members think that supply chain. Uh, supply chain issues will get better this year, right? Uh, almost only 11% said they already were better, right? Uh, at some point uh, in 2022. Uh, I think when, when you look at a lot of the data points that we've received, certainly since this survey came out, um, uh, over the overall supply chain issues have trended in the right direction, right? Uh, if you're looking at delivery times, if you're looking at freight costs, if you're looking at you know bottlenecks that are in the overall system, uh, there's a lot of reason to be optimistic that these, uh, even where there are supply chain issues, that they have trended, again, in, in the right direction. 
freight uh, overall freight costs and over uh, are not essentially where they were before uh, the pandemic, but they're but they're getting normalized, and I think that certainly is an encouraging sign that at least some of these supply chain issues are getting better. Now they might be getting better for the wrong reason, right? And that is that the, the global economy has slowed, and so that some of those bottlenecks have caught up. Uh, but nonetheless, they have caught up, uh, and. I think it's also important to note that that how you define what a supply chain challenge is matters here as well, right? If the reason why you're having supply chain issues is that you don't have enough workers, well, that's not something that has been solved yet, right? It's not likely to be solved anytime soon. Um, if your issue was that you don't have enough chips, right? Um, we're certainly doing a lot to increase uh, you know, semiconductor capacity in the US, but that's probably not something that's gonna get solved totally until 2024 or, or later. So I think it, it does matter how you're defining it. And I do hear, when, again, when I travel around the country, that there are still some lingering supply chain issues out there. And, and where they are there, uh, they, they tend to still be uh, significant. The other kind of headline when we released this survey um, uh, a month or so ago uh, was this one, right? That 62% uh, of our members thought we were going to go into a recession this year, right? Um, uh, as you heard me say earlier, I think since this survey was taken, um, I think there's a lot more conversation out there about a, the soft landing and the possibility of a soft landing. And we've had some even better data uh, as it relates to retail sales and other things uh, since then. And so I, I, I actually think that while a recession is still part, you know, possible, I think a soft landing is also possible. And I think you're gonna see that a little bit uh, when we get the next survey out. So I, I mentioned uh, I mentioned ISM earlier. So let's 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 kind of talk a little bit about the Institute for Supply Management's survey. Um, uh, you can see here, this is pretty much every sentiment survey looks like this, right? Um, at, uh, we had a solid growth at this time last year, right? In new orders and production, et cetera, uh, and then things have deteriorated a little bit since then, right? Again, for the reasons I mentioned earlier, about the, the Ukrainian uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine in February of last year over the summer, really high levels of inflation, right? Um, worries about a recession. I started hearing about worries about a recession start, starting last spring, right? So all of those have really taken a toll. Uh, and so you, you see here that really over the last three months, uh, the PMI, the Purchasing Managers Index, has fallen below 50, right? Um, uh, and this is, again, pretty consistent across the board. You've seen some pullbacks uh, in overall activity. And I think the one notable here is that the green line, which is new orders, have pulled back pretty sharply, right? Now we will be getting a new uh, a new reading for uh, the ISM next week. Uh, we always get ISM uh, reports on the first day of the month, and it's March already. So next Wednesday, we will get uh, the next reading for ISM. I expect this number to, to improve a little bit from where it was in January. Certainly, if you're looking at a lot of the kind of preliminary data that are out there, we still might be contracting, but I I, I get a sense that. Those numbers have improved uh, in February relative to where they were in January, uh, so that's a, you know if, if you're looking for some signs of of, of uh, glimmers of hope there, I think that's certainly something to watch. Uh, but so I guess I'll use that to segue into manufacturing production, then I'll then I'll, I'll continue to kind of make the point I was going to make. Uh, we did have, and I mentioned this at the very beginning, very disappointing numbers when it comes to manufacturing production in both November and December. Uh, you were seeing weaker data across the board. Retail sales numbers also were very weak in November and December. So we ended the year on a very weak note uh, uh, as it relates to manufacturing production. The good news is that we rebounded from that in January, not totally making up the losses that we had seen in the prior two months, but we did have some pretty broad-based increases in manufacturing production which hopefully will continue as we move in, into February. And I think the one thing that I, I continue to hear as I'm, as I'm talking to folks around the country is that, yes, you're, you're seeing some weaker activity, certainly towards the end of last year, uh, but you're, you're, you're kind of pulling back from a really strong base, right? So it's not unheard of for me to talk to a manufacturer and say, yeah, uh, we've seen some, some weakness of sales uh, at the end of the year, beginning of this year, uh, but on a year-over-year -year basis, our, our sales are still up. Right, and so that that conversation I think is pretty consistent with what I hear across the board. The other the other comment I'll make here is that if you go back a few months, uh, manufacturing production actually was was we're seeing some of the best activity we've seen since two thousand eight. Right, uh, there's a lot of evidence that companies have continued to try to increase capacity to try to meet the demand that is out there. Right, and, and yes, we've seen that pull back uh, in the last few months, but but again, you're kind of pulling back from a relatively strong base. 
Um, so I won't go through, uh, and I, I guess I should have said this earlier, these slides are available, so um, uh, we'll make sure everyone everyone has them. Um, uh, so January, this is the January month over month numbers. Uh, again, more positive than not, right? So you're seeing a lot of growth. Again, a rebound from what we saw in November and December, kind of on a month over month basis. Well, perhaps the more interesting numbers for me are over the last 12 months. Uh, and you, you can see here the sectors that have really performed well over the last year. Uh, apparel is at the top of the list there. Again, that was a bit of a rebound. Um, aerospace is doing a lot better than it was, say, this time last year or certainly in 2021. Motor vehicles have bounced back uh, from the chip ch uh, ch challenges that they were having uh, last year. So, again, at the top of the list, some, some sectors that have fared well. We still have some, some rooms for improvement for some of those sectors at the bottom. Um, but overall, um, uh, uh, while a mixed bag, there are some encouraging signs there uh, for some, uh, some of those sectors. Uh, the, the one, uh, I think we're gonna be getting new durable goods orders. Uh, I think it's tomorrow. It's tomorrow. Um, and so we'll be updating this chart a little bit. But what I like about this chart is this is, new, this is overall factory orders. So it's both durable and non-durable goods. But you can see here that it, uh, last year was really a tale of two, uh, of two halves, right? The first half of the year, you continue to see some of that resilience that I spoke about earlier, kind of continuing to build up in terms of overall activity as, com as manufacturers were, were trying to increase capacity to, to meet the demand that was out there. And then it started plateauing off, right, uh, as you got to the middle of the year. Uh, and then you started seeing a bit of a pullback uh, in kind of those disappointing November and December numbers. Uh, much like manufacturing production, I would expect you'll see a bit of a rebound uh, when we get the January figures. But I think this, this is this is helpful to make the point that I was making earlier that on a year over year basis, you still see some growth here, uh, even though things have kind of plateaued off or, or pulled pull, pull back a little bit in, in recent months. Uh, and, and another there's a couple charts in here, which I think kind of help kind of make that case. And so this is one of them. this is capital goods, capital goods spending. Um, capital, this is a proxy for capital spending in the U.S., so it's core capital goods, so you can see at the bottom there, kind of in the note, it's non-defense capital goods, excluding aircraft, if you're looking for it in the actual report itself. Uh, you can see we had all-time highs for this in, 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 as recently as two or three months ago, right? Uh, and even though we've pulled, we kind of pulled back a little bit at the end of the year, uh, still not far from an all-time high. Uh, so I, I was speaking to a, a, a company, a manufacturer who is really involved in capital spending. They're kind of a nice proxy for me if I'm thinking of how, ca how capital spending is doing in the U.S. economy. They're continuing to do quite well, right? So you're still seeing capital spending happening, and that certainly is an encouraging sign. Uh, I didn't give you this chart. Uh, I can give it to you if you're looking for it. Uh, we'll be getting a new, new figure for it next week, um, also on March 1st. But, but construction spending... Uh, also is not far from an all-time high. So again, that's a sign to me that companies are reinvesting in themselves. Uh, the other number that kind of is, is a corollary to that is obviously the job postings figures. So those are all, to me, signs that, uh, you know, we're still seeing elevated levels of capital spending, construction activity, at least in manufacturing, uh, and, and, and hiring, which are, which are all kind of encouraging. So this is a chart I actually updated it this morning, uh, largely because... Uh, we just updated it with two, the 2020, uh, the, the 2022 uh, rankings here. So this is the top 10 markets that we sell into. Uh, so this is from the 2022. These are the top 10 markets we export into. Uh, starting Canada is number one and Switzerland now is number 10. Uh, and so you can see here, this is not a pretty chart, right? Uh, uh, lots of red on this chart, unfortunately. So, you know, given that kind of ranking, uh, nine of the markets, top 10 markets that we sell into had contracting manufacturing sectors uh, in the month of January. Um, so that's the bad news. The good news, <laughs> the bad, the good news here is that uh, in, in, in most, almost all of these markets, there was improvements between December and January. So kind of going back to that glimmer of hope comment I made earlier. Uh, when, when I look around the world, the, there's three kind of buckets that I put the world into. Um, the first is obviously China. Uh, China here, you see 40, 49.2. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if when we get the February reading again next week, uh, that if it's it's blue, right? Um, uh, largely what has, what has hit China hard over the last year was kind of a ridiculous zero COVID policy that they had for much of the year that led to lots of production decline, uh, delays and closures uh, throughout much of the summer and again in the fall. And then once they got rid of the zero COVID policy after President Xi's re-election, if you want to call it that, um, 
uh, they, they suffered with COVID uh, more recently. And so you're starting to see kind of as, as they're coming out of that round of COVID, uh, some, some increased activity in China. And so that should lead to some better improvement uh, in, in the coming months there. China continues to slow, right? They only grew 3% last year on a year-for-year -year basis. Um, looking for more like 4 to 5% growth this year. Uh, and so that's obviously a, a sign of some re renewed activity. Uh, that's part of the upward uh, risk to the outlook, right, is obviously uh, growing China is good for Asia. It's good for the overall global economy. And so that should, should help lift many of these markets you see up here. As goes China, so goes the rest of Asia. So you're seeing weakness in South Korea, right, and, and other pockets of Asia as well. The other uh, other comment is emerging markets. And so China is classified as an emerging market. Almost all emerging markets are export led, right? So they depend on a global economy, right? So slower global growth means your export uh, activity is reduced. Uh, many of them also um, are uh, heavily indebted and and uh, with dollar denominated debt. And so when uh, the dollar is strong, uh, that obviously affects their ability to pay back that debt. Uh, many of them also have been forced to raise interest rates, and so that certainly is not a recipe for growth either. With that said, you can see up here the emerging market PMI in January was just shy of being neutral, and so we've seen some stabilization there, which uh, could be encouraging. Uh, and then the other big bucket here is obviously Europe, right? So uh, Europe has everything to do with the war in Ukraine, uh, higher energy costs, higher food costs. Uh, there was a lot of worry about recession in Europe, right? Um, the good news in Europe is that um, oh, they've had a warmer winter than we feared, right? And so as a, as a result, they you have not seen the pullbacks in activity that we were expecting. They also, at least for right now, have avoided a recession, uh, but there are still some continued lingering uncertainties out there uh, in the European economy. Um, the UK is not part of the Eurozone, as you know, and so part of what's affecting that is also Brexit. Uh, and so I, I say all this to say, uh, uh, this is who buys our products. We want as much blue up here as possible. The only blue here, the only expanding manufacturing sector is in Canada. So, uh, you know, we, 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 we want a, a, a stronger global growth so we can see increased exports and, and hopefully you'll start seeing some better performance at kind of in the coming months. The other kind of international piece that I'll, I'll throw out here is that the dollar, if I were giving this presentation four or five months ago, the dollar was the story, right? Uh, we saw a soaring dollar. Uh, this is a trade weighted index, but you know, you, we all know that the, the, the pound and, and, and euro hit were close to parity or at parity for, for part of that time period. You saw the yen hit an all time low relative to the dollar. So you had a lot of issues with regard to currency. All, almost every earnings report talked about the strong dollar. We've seen the dollar uh, depreciate since then. You can see 6.2% 6, 6 decline since mid-October. Uh, the storyline really of the last couple of weeks, and I haven't put that here in the, in the text yet, is that we have started to see a bit of a rebound in the dollar uh, really in the last few weeks. That has Almost all of this has everything to do with the Fed, right? And uh, at least initially, that more dovish sentiment, right? The fact that the Fed was going to pivot at some point was really what helped the dollar kind of fall. More recently, now there's much been much more of a hawkishness on the part of the Fed, and that's I think is helping the the dollar kind of appreciate uh, here more recently. Overall, though, you that 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 larger trend kind of is is still there. You still hear a little bit about the dollar strength overall, but uh, uh, largely that depreciation has helped overall export markets. Um, the, so the big story, the next probably next dozen slides here are on the on the labor market, uh, because this is this is the, the the biggest bright spot in the economy, right? Uh, we all we all saw the reaction when we had the five hundred and seventeen thousand uh, overall non farm payroll growth in the month of January. That certainly is a number in, that was much bigger than anyone was expecting, including me. There's probably some seasonal adjustment elements to that figure, uh, but still very strong growth overall on the employment side. Uh, the unemployment rate uh, surprisingly fell to 3.4% uh, in January, which was the lowest since May 1969, right? So uh, we're clearly in what we economists call full employment territory at this point, right? So very solid labor market. Uh, I do expect to see some cooling in the labor market moving forward. Uh, look for maybe a four handle at some point later this year, maybe as high as four and a half, right? Um, 
Uh, some economists uh, maybe call for five. Uh, I don't think we're going to get to five. I think it's probably going to be more like between four and four and a half. Uh, but think about that sentence for a second. Think about the fact that there's a lot of worry about a recession in 2023, right? Combine that with an unemployment rate that's four, four and a half, wait, currently 3.4, right? There's a huge disconnect there, right? Uh, normally, recessions, you don't have unemployment rates that are this close to full employment, right? So you can go back and see where we were in the last couple of recessions. Obviously, looking at the pandemic, that was kind of crazy. But in the Great Recession, you know, we peaked out at 10, uh, 10 percent, right? So these are kind of unheard of numbers. And, and a large part of why that soft landing is more possible uh, is because the labor market is as strong as it is. Um, now, with that said, there's a, there's a huge asterisk after that, and that is that the labor market, the labor force participation rate, is a lot different than it was before the pandemic, right? Um, you can see here that the participation rate is about what, one percentage point lower than it was before the pandemic. And that, obviously that trend line was moving down, right? Demographics plays into this. Uh, we've had a lot of accelerated retirements, right? Um, which have played into it. Um, you have uh, immigration, right? Plays into this overall figure. The fact that we are a lot less welcoming of immigrants than we were say a few years ago, I think plays into it. We're upside down in our birth rates, right? So population, we, we actually need more people, right? And so immigration can, can certainly fill part of that gap. Uh, I hear all the time about childcare. Uh, there are a lot of our manufacturers tell us about childcare deserts around the country, uh, how expensive it is for childcare, assuming it's available at all. And that's holding some parents out of the labor market. And that that is, is a huge challenge. Um, and then the other other kind of big question, and let's put it out there, we can talk more about it in the Q&A if you want, is, is there is this conversation about where did men go? Uh, for whatever reason, young men, um, uh, less than 35, uh, with less education, have not come back to the extent we would have expected uh, once the pandemic ended. Right? Um, we certainly have seen um, uh, increased uh, self-employment, right? So perhaps that's part of the story. Uh, gig. The gig economy could be part of this conversation. Uh, we we hear from some of our members that Uber Eats, for instance, is a competitor for talent, right? Um, and and there are, you know there are other other connotations that you might have about that. But but in, in general, that this is the big head scratcher is is where did men go? Uh, again, they haven't come back to the degree we would have, we would have expected. Women have come back largely despite those childcare uh, concerns that I mentioned earlier. So that that's certainly something for us to watch. When it comes to manufacturing employment, we've just had solid growth over the last two years, right? So if you look at manufacturing employment growth in 2021 and 2022, we actually added more workers in that two-year period than we have in any two-year period since 1983 and 1984. So this, this is a talking point that Joe Biden makes. And so if you heard that reference made uh, in the State of the Union, it, it, it's definitely a true one. Uh, and and we, we continue to have, you know, again, pretty solid uh, growth, 19,000 workers added in the month of January. We will get new employment numbers at the end of next week. We always get new jobs data on the first Friday of the month. So that's, again, it's next week. Uh, and I think the, the other kind of more uh, uplifting story here is that we are almost at 13 million workers in the sector. Who would have thought we'd get back to 13 million workers in manufacturing? Uh, but that's where we are, right? So this is the most employment we've had in the sector since November 2008, right? So uh, a, a nice encouraging sign of employment growth uh, even with all of the things that, uh, of technology and the automation and everything else, we've continued to add to our workforce. Uh, and the other you know, big storyline here is that job openings continue to be very elevated, right? So we're still, everyone is looking for workers, right? Uh, 764,000 workers, uh, is that how many job postings there were in manufacturing in December? Again, we'll get a new reading for this one also next week. Everything is next week. Um, uh, for, this is the JOLTS data, the job openings and labor turnover survey data. Uh, and you know those numbers have stayed elevated much more than, so since the pandemic than we than we certainly were seeing in the pre-pandemic era. Uh, and the one thing that I hear from a lot of manufacturers is there's still a lot of churn out there, right? Uh, this time last year, uh, quit rates were at an all-time high, not just for manufacturing, but kind of across the board uh, in, in all sectors. And while we've seen that cooling off a little bit more recently, you still had more than 4 million Americans quit their job in the month of December. It's a lot of quitting happening, right? And, and anytime people quit, that means you gotta look for more workers, right? So that means more job postings, right? <laughs> right. So that, that's kind of a bit of a, a, a bit of a vicious cycle there. Uh, and, and kind of the big overall arching, overarching story here is that 
there are more job openings than people who are actively looking for work, right? This, this is a phenomenon that had never existed before 2018, uh, and yet it has existed pretty consistently outside of the pandemic since then uh, and has continued to widen, right? So right now it's basically almost a two to one ratio. There are 11 uh, million job openings in the US, not manufacturing, but for overall, uh, and uh, 5.7 million unemployed Americans, right? So that's for every 100 job openings, there's only 52 people who are actively looking for work, which is why everybody, everybody is scrambling for talent, right? And, and you don't need me to tell you this, you just have to go to a restaurant or a hotel and see the lack of service, right? Uh, you have to drive down the street to see signing bonuses. And, you know, you can go to uh, places like grocery stores and fast food restaurants where they pay 16, 17, 18, 19 bucks an hour. Uh, Bucky's who pays 20, $22 an hour. You know, you see a lot of places out there which are just really scrambling for talent. And, and so the result of that is that wage growth has, has picked up, right? Um, manufacturers tell me uh, that m many of them have had to raise wages two, three, four times over the last couple of years to feel like they were staying competitive um, in their local markets with, with other, uh, other sectors. Um, uh, and, and in the January data, uh, production workers and manufacturing uh, in terms of over average average hourly earnings, we're up 5.3% year over year, right? This is a number that is just shy of 26 bucks an hour. So if you're looking for a number attached to this, that's what it is. Um, if, you if you look at all workers in manufacturing, not just production workers, that average is just shy of being 32 bucks an hour. Right? So these are, these are pretty significant in the figures, um, and yet we've seen the gap between what manufacturers pay and other sectors pay kind of narrow a little bit. And so that competition has been pretty fierce. Uh, the other kind of comment to make here, and this is a nice segue to talk about inflation, uh, is that uh, this number was 5.9% year over year. Um, uh, again, basically at, at this point at the last year, that was the most in 40 years, right? So that 40 year comparison is pretty consistent with what we're seeing in overall inflationary data. Uh, and with that in mind, um, See, the consumer price index is up by more than this, right? And so in real terms, purchasing power has actually been negative. So that's a nice segue to talk about the next three charts, which are on inflation. And this chart is where, where I always start with the PCE deflator. This is the, the, the price index for personal spending. Um, but the reason why I start with it is, is this is the preferred measure of inflation for the Fed, right? Uh, if, if you follow me on Twitter, you'll see a new version of this chart tomorrow because we're going to get an update of it tomorrow uh, for January. Um, the goal, if you hear Jay Powell speak at all, uh, the goal for the Fed is to get uh, core inflation down to 2% right, over the long term. That is the red line. right? And you can see we are nowhere near 2%, which is why the Fed has continued to be as aggressive as it has. Right. If we go back to this time last year, the Fed funds rate was effectively zero, right? It was like zero to 25 basis points. Today, it is of, of 450 to 475 basis points, right? So you've seen a huge increase uh, uh, in the overall uh, interest rates for Fed funds. Um, look for the Fed to raise rates again in March by 25 basis points, maybe as much as 50 basis points, but let's just go, we'll go with the assumption that the next three meetings are 25. They're going to raise it uh, 25 basis points in March, 25 basis points in May, and 25 basis points in June. Uh, so it's another 75 basis points. You, you have heard some calls for that to be 50 and 25, but either, either way, uh, it's another 75 basis points to go. That would bring the Fed funds rate up to basically 5.5%. So it's a very rapid increase in interest rates over a very short period of time. Again, the Fed's trying to wring inflation out of the system. Uh, and, and the challenge here and why these numbers continue to go higher and higher uh, is that th this has been pretty stubborn, right? Um, so the good news is, uh, and again, if you got my Monday reports, this is what I think the headline this, this last week, but um, we have seen moderation uh, in, in inflationary pressure. So on the, on the year over year basis, these figures have started to come down. So that's true, whether you're doing the PCE deflator, uh, whether you're looking at the producer price index, which is for wholesale costs or input costs, uh, or whether you're looking at the consumer price index, uh, we have seen moderation, especially in headline inflation, right? Um, that, that moderation will continue over the course of this year, especially as you get more favorable comparison months, right? Uh, I expect uh, these year over year numbers to fall pretty dramatically as you get to the summer when we're comparing to the really rapid inflation we had last year, for instance. But the problem is on a month over month basis, 
there still is some pretty stubborn inflation out there, which is why I kept it up on this chart, right? Uh, rents are still pretty high, right? Food costs are still going up at a pretty solid clip. People are still traveling, so transportation services are still up pretty significantly. Uh, and so there's you know, wage growth continues to be pretty solid. And so all of that is really keeping inflationary pressures uh, first and foremost in a lot of folks' minds uh, and why the Fed feels that it has to continue to raise rates to try to wring more inflation out of the system. That does create uh, uncertainty in the economic outlook, and we'll talk about that in a minute, right? Um, but 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 that's essentially what the Fed is doing. Um, uh, so you saw that obviously in housing, like the housing market uh, was really has been in a recession really over much of the last year. Um, you're starting to see maybe some signs of green uh, of green shoots there, but still uh, overall a negative picture. And you see it also in consumer sentiment. So this is the consumer confidence numbers from the University of Michigan. They hit an all-time low last June when gas prices hit an all-time high, right? They have bounced back since then, right? Uh, but still nowhere as high as you might expect. And, that, and that's largely because the consumer, much like uh, businesses, are still worried about the, the economic outlook. Um, doesn't mean that they're not spending, <laughs> uh, but it means that maybe they're, you know, maybe they're, they're doing some, some, some shifting of, of, of how they spend. So let's do the outlook and then we'll take some questions here. So... Uh, you saw this morning, uh, GDP in the fourth quarter was uh, up to 2.7%. That was a slight revision lower, was 2.9% before that. Uh, so we ended the year on a pretty solid note, right? Even though we began 2022 with two declining months of, uh, uh, two, two declining quarters of G GDP, we ended the year with some pretty solid growth uh, in the third and fourth quarter. In the first quarter, the quarter we're in right now, I, I actually see us growing. I have 1.8 up here. Uh, so we're, we're having some resilience in the economy. Some of that figure is actually from that bounce back we saw in January in retail sales and industrial production and other categories. Uh, and then you start seeing some weakening of the economy as the year goes on. Um, this is obviously a soft landing scenario, right? And, and as I see the soft landing scenario, you continue to pull back, right? As you get towards the end of the year, and then start growing back again, uh, growing around 2% or so next year. It doesn't mean a recession, again, is not possible. And so some of these numbers might start weaken if, if, if you start seeing some more dramatic pullbacks in the economy. But that's that's the soft landing scenario. Um, so let's talk about the upside and downside risks, right? So um, uh, on, the, on the downside risk, the Fed is still raising rates, right? Uh, and we know that, the, that monetary policy has very long lags. We won't know the full extent of the damage of that for many months months to come, and we're just now probably getting a sense of what those drags were from the rates that went up last year. Uh, so again, we saw that in housing. We've seen that in some other areas. So the Fed, that is a huge risk. They're obviously are they're, they're risking slower growth or a recession to try to wring inflation out of the system, much like Paul Volcker did in the 80s, right, in terms of, of, of that particular method. The other, uh, other big challenges, you see that at the top of the list here, obviously we don't know how the Russian war uh, in, in Ukraine ends, right? There's still um, a lot of uncertainty, especially in Europe, but as, as it relates to that. Slower global growth, although I do think that we're gonna see better growth this year than we would have we would have suggested, say, maybe two months ago, but still slower than we would like. Uh, inventories are a challenge. And so I hear this, uh, especially amongst retailers, but I think you hear it from some manufacturers as well, that rising inventory levels are a red flag. Um, we've in many ways been talking ourselves into a recession for months. Uh, uh, maybe now I, you might argue we're talking ourselves into a soft landing, <laughs> hopefully. Uh, but we have been talking ourselves into a recession for a while. And so that that obviously is, is, a, is a big risk that, you know, it almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. At, at the bottom side here, the, 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 the soft landing scenario entirely depends on the labor market, right? The fact that people, we're still having solid wage growth, we're still having solid job growth, means that people still are spending, and that's where you get that resilience in, in the overall economy. That either gives us the soft landing, or if we're going to have a recession, it's a much more milder one, given that strength of the labor market, given that disconnect we talked about earlier. The other big tailwind that's out there is that uh, we had a huge infrastructure package uh, go through the Congress last year, and a lot of those Billions of dollars are flowing out the door right now, right? So that's going to continue to provide some uh, buffer to any downside winds you have in the economy. Uh, lots of dollars moving out. You have a lot of reshoring and nearshoring happening. Uh, semiconductors uh, active spending is also happening. So all that should provide a bit of a tailwind and give us some upside risks uh, to the outlook. So that's a lot of talking on my part. And uh, 
we have plenty of time for Q&A here, but I'm just, uh, uh, Michael, I guess I'll turn it back over to you. I'll leave my contact information up there briefly, and then I'll, I'll stop sharing my slides. Chad, thank you. Appreciate all the information. Very informative. Um, I'm not, uh, I guess, I don't, I checking, I checked the chat. I'm not sure of any Q and A. Um, so if, uh, to the audience, if there's any questions or thoughts, please, uh, share them. Um, we would love to, we're here to, we have plenty of time to go through any Q and A. Hey, Chad, you know, it's interesting. I, I saw, uh, inventory levels. It's definitely been a conversation amongst a number of our clients. Um, you know, I would I would ask, uh, you know, is that, I think it's a lot because of the supply chain disruption and now obviously that not really being an issue. And I saw that still being a concern yeah. in your survey uh, was yeah. number two, if I'm not mistaken. So just trying to figure out the correlation of, uh, of, of what you what you think there because we we are seeing increased inventories a lot of that is yes. because we're changing the days right having yes. longer lead times uh because yes. of the disruption so now they're looking at that uh differently so so i think you know that's part of the disentanglement of the inventory story is what you just described right i think companies because of the supply chain bottlenecks are keeping a little bit more inventory on hand anyway right, right. mostly as a hedge because the last thing they want to do is shut down production again right so they are keeping a little bit more. And, and I've heard from some of our small and medium sized folks, for instance, that they've had to add on additional warehousing space, right? To house some of these additional, you know, cause they, again, they don't want to run out of inventory of those inputs. And so, especially if they're a critical in, input, right? So they've had to do that. But there also is the flip side of that, right? And I, I, I mentioned earlier on the retail side, you hear a lot about excess inventory. Part of that um, is maybe they ordered some of the wrong things, <laughs> right? Or yeah. there's some excess buying there. Uh, um, and now they're having to do some pretty deep, deep discounting of some of those things because yeah. trying to get rid of that inventory. But the big, the big risk there is, and to the extent we see it in manufacturing, is this is a huge red flag for a recession normally, right? If, if you start seeing inventory build up because demand isn't there, right? Mm -hmm. And we saw earlier in those ISM charts that demand was pulling back pretty strongly, right? So there is certainly some, um, some, some, some correlation there. Then that it leads to the normal business cycle kind of relationship. Um, I haven't seen that fully play itself out yet, so I'm not sure it's a pull your hair out you know, st storyline yet. But it's certainly something that we're watching um, to see if inventories continue to rise uh, and if that's a kind of a precursor to to, to some some business cycle conditions that uh, but might cool the labor market off, et cetera. Okay, we're getting some questions in. Uh, any thoughts on the new rules uh, limiting? tax deduction on research and development costs that will have an adverse impact on manufacturers. So as you know, the, the NEM has long supported uh, the research and development tax credit. Uh, we've been advocating for that for a number of years. Um, uh, uh, certainly, hopefully you're a member of the NEM, and if you are, you, you're certainly following what we're doing in that space, continuing to push to get those put back in there. Um, we know that innovation, you know, manufacturers actually are, are responsible for 55% of all of the R&D in, in the business sector, right? And so we're a, a driver of new innovation that certainly helps provide productivity growth, lots, lots of new jobs, lots of competitiveness for the sector. And I think the real worry there is if you don't have those R&D tax credits, that gives an advantage to other countries that do, right? Uh, and so the last thing we want to do is is put U.S. manufacturers at a disadvantage to some of our foreign counterparts, but it also is going to slow down activity, right, and, and, and make us less competitive moving forward. So uh, we've been pushing for that to be put back in, uh, as, you, as you would expect. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we've been talking about the R&D tax credit for all 12 years I've been at the NAM, and we're going to continue to talk about it. So uh, definitely something that's on our radar. Okay. Can you comment on why the paper industry is down so much in your presentation? Um, do you see that changing? And and where was the paper industry, say, six or 12 months ago? Yeah, paper is one of those. It depends on what paper you're talking about, right? So that's obviously the broad, broad category. Um, yeah. Paper can be um, a concurrent indicator, right? So if you're talking about um, Amazon boxes, right, <laughs> any kind of packaging, uh, that certainly can be a sign of of activity in the U.S. 
I think the larger trend line there as it relates to paper, though, uh, is that we has uh, the sector is undergoing a lot of a lot of change given technology, given uh, uh, changing consumer habits, et cetera. And so that's really what's affecting that more than anything. Uh, um, but uh, with that said, I think there are certainly some bright spots in, in, in the paper side. And a lot of that has to do with packaging and the other places where I think those are continued growth areas for the sector. Um, yeah. We have a question that, that says, technically speaking, are, are is the U.S. already in a recession? So no, um, and, and, and uh, uh, first off, I congratulate you for this question because it means you listen to your econ 101 textbook, right? When it's <laughs> when it said that a recession was was kind of generally defined as two declining quarters of GDP, right? Um, that was always more of a guideline. It was not really the full definition. Um, the reality is that the National Bureau of Economic Research that kind of designates when we're in a recession, when we both go into one as well, well as when we come out of one, they're looking at a whole host of data points. And, and what they're essentially looking for is a peak and a trough, right? When did overall activity peak and when did it trough and come out of it? So that gives you that recession and, and then a recovery. The challenge here is that while out, the GDP fell at the beginning part of last year, employment, as you saw, didn't, right? And so there are a lot of other measures out there that you would look at if you're kind of designated we're in a recession, which continued to rise over that period. And so that, that's why we, we were not in a recession and why the National Bureau of Economic Research is, is unlikely to say that, that those first two quarters were. The other kind of comment to make is, uh, well, I can make two. The first is it doesn't have to be two quarters either, right? The last recession we had uh, was just two months. Uh, and that was from February to April of 2020, right? So it was that pandemic, that peak and trough, right? Between February and March when everything kind of shut down and everything closed. That was really that peak and trough of, 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 a, of a time. The third comment is more of a kind of a defensive one. And that is <clears throat> that um, the reality is most Americans, if you were to ask them, probably think we are in a recession or have been in a recession. And so my kind of defense of saying we're not in one is somewhat maybe more academic than not. Um, I think the, 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 the more interesting uh, thing there is, is hopefully, uh, as you start seeing better labor market, continue to see labor market activity, as we continue to see some better data this year, we start talking ourselves into a soft landing, right? And so, um, but I, I suspect many Americans have probably already thought we're in a recession, so it probably makes it more of an academic conversation of whether we are or not. But, and I felt more on the defensive over the last year than not in saying we weren't in one. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, as you said, uh, rising inventories, discounting those that product to push it out the door. And, 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 and there were a lot of supply chain factors that really played into some of those negative numbers that we had at the beginning of last year. For us. So that little bit of that shifting of dynamics, uh, especially when it came to net exports and inventories that kind of played into those figures. Yeah. Do you think that the labor market will continue to be uh, tight, you know, in the last I don't know, quarter or so you've seen, you know, I know it's coming in the tech sector, but you're also starting to see even some professional services uh, in, in that sector. Uh, you're, you're seeing large anticipated or large announcements of, of layoffs. So yeah. how does that I mean, correlate? And what do you- I mean, I do, as I said earlier, I do expect that number, the overall labor market will cool a little bit, right? So I do, I, I think the unemployment rate could easily go up to 4% or more, right? Right. But still, 4% is a still a solid number, right? And so I think, you know, we have to kind of make that all relative. Mm -hmm. uh, on those tech layoffs, um, those folks aren't unemployed very long. Um, <laughs> the reality is they have skill sets that are very much in demand. Um, uh, and so you're not seeing them waiting in the unemployment line for very long. They're quickly picking up other jobs, especially given, um, especially given how tight the labor market is right now. So, yeah. okay. Do you think that the Fed will comment regarding the, the deficit, uh, you know, the, the the trillion dollar plus deficits just re, re, reduce inflation and increase inflation or have uh, no effect on inflation? I think this question maybe might be about the the de the, the overall budget yeah. deficit, correct? Yeah. Right. Um, I mean, I think the big the big storyline really over the next few months is that um, uh, we need to raise the, the debt ceiling, right? Um, we are already over our debt ceiling, and so the, the Treasury Secretary is doing some pretty extraordinary measures, largely between now and June or July, depending on how revenues come in, try to avert, uh, avert a default, right? And so now it's the political gamesmanship between now and then 
of, of, of how will we raise the budget deficit, uh, what conditions uh, are Republicans likely to demand uh, be placed on that to get that debt ceiling raised. Um, the encouraging sign is that uh, both Speaker Mac uh, McCarthy and, and, and on the Senate side, uh, McConnell have said they did not intend to default, right? So hopefully there'll be some, some arrangement here made towards the end, felt likely towards the end of this process, which uh, avoids a default. Um, in the meantime, obviously, the Fed's going to be watching that very closely, right? The last thing you want is for us to default on our debt. Uh, this could, it could be some pretty serious ramifications of that. And so when you're looking at financial conditions, the Fed obviously is going to be watching that pretty closely. What is affecting the decrease in the wood industry? Uh, decrease in housing? Yeah, I think that certainly is part of it. I suspect a large part of it. I mean, uh, there have been, you know, the, these are obviously month over month or year over year numbers. There's obviously been times in the last couple of years where wood has done well, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. But but more recently, obviously, uh, you know, the housing market is 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 quite depressed, right? Uh, largely because you know if you think about the mortgage market, right? Mortgages this time last year were. were 3% for a 30 year mortgage, right? Or actually kind of just a bit, maybe a little bit north of that by by February, but um, they almost settled off at 7% at one point, right? And now they've kind of settled back to about 6%. And so uh, that's pulled a lot of people out of the market. Uh, affordability continues to be a challenge. Um, and while you start to see some folks start to trickle back into the labor market, I'm assuming to the housing market, uh, it's still uh, much more depressed relative to where it was a year ago or two years ago, right? So that's uh, affecting overall housing starts, which could implicitly be affecting some of the wood demand. Yeah. Well, and if I'm not mistaken too, during, right after the pandemic, the, the, the housing, you know, the housing demand and the construction industry just, uh, and, the, and the wood the yes. sector just went through the roof, right? It was it did. quite it expensive. Did. Yeah. It did, yeah. What's your opinion on how much more interest rate changes will, will make, uh, uh, changes will the Fed make in order to get to a two percent inflation? Well, I mean, I think well. First off, uh, the Fed is not going to look to cut rates this year, right? And so, at, at some point, financial markets will get that through their heads. <laughs> and that the Fed is not going to cut rates this year. They never were going to cut rates this year, uh, and yet a lot of market analysts kind of assume that they were, largely on this belief that we were going to have a recession and maybe a severe recession, and therefore the Fed would be forced to cut rates later this year. That was never going to happen, right? And so the markets are suddenly reacting to that reality. The Fed is likely to start cutting rates, if they do at all, uh, sometime in 2024. Um, in terms of overall in, in inflation, um, I mean, I, as I said, I, I expect to see continued moderation in those, those year-over-year rates. I think consumer price index is likely to be down to about 3% uh, year-over-year by December uh, and get down to closer to the 2% number not two, but closer to it uh, by the end of 2024, right? So you are going to get um, you are going to get some of that moderation that the Fed is looking for. Will they get to two? I don't think so, but I think that they'll get close to it um, by the end of 2024. Well, I mean, as we're talking about the housing market, and and and, and I know that has a big impact in the economy, but also the, the deal flow, right? As as valuations yes. on businesses and small, you know, and, and transactions happen. If I'm not mistaken, transactions have have decreased over over thirty percent year over year, and the impact of that is valuations and obviously the 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 interest factor. Do you have any comment on that? And if you still see that going into twenty twenty four, will there? You know, yeah, I think that's I think that's all true. I mean, obviously, higher interest rates raises the cost of capital. It raises you know that means certain projects when you're doing the IRR aren't going to happen, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think the probably the more surprising thing to me is how little I hear about it, right? <laughs> Manufacturers do not tell me that higher interest rates are a primary problem for them, right? Inflation is, right? <laughs> Lack of workers is, uh, and maybe just people just don't tell me that, but it's I, I don't hear about uh, the challenge of higher interest rates as much as you might expect that I will, would. Um, and, and, and quite frankly, that's a surprise to me because I, yeah. I would think it would be a bigger challenge. Uh, and maybe it's just because other things rise higher to the surface than, 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 than rates at this point. I'm going to do one last question. I think we have uh, like a few minutes left. 
How, how do you see the U.S. and China relations over the next few years and its impact on U.S. manufacturing? Let's, you say the toughest for last here. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I, I mean, obviously they haven't been more strained uh, for uh, strained for the, the, it, than they are right now, right? Um, obviously, that was true before the balloon, <laughs> and it's still uh, true today. Um, uh, and, and so, I mean, I mean, look, we U.S. needs China, China needs us, right? And so there, there is kind of a synergy there, and, and yet because of the challenges that we've seen over the last couple of years, because of the geopolitical tensions, right? Certainly the, the Taiwan issue, especially, um, it's it's become uh, ever more important for us to make sure that we that we have the resources that we need here in the U.S., right? So that's why you're seeing the investments in the chip space. Right? That's why you're seeing some investments made to make sure that we have uh, adequate uh, critical minerals and, and something that we need for some of these so, so for the production process. Um, and the other, kind, I think, bigger kind of storyline that's out there, and this is true not just for China, but I think just globally, is this pullback from globalization that we've really seen over the last five years, right? Um, uh, and, and how many manufacturers say that if, we're, if they're making something in a country, they're making it to sell in that country, right? Uh, and that's true of China, right? Um, mm. If they're, if they're going to... If they're gonna, sell something in the US, they're gonna make it in the US. So I think that pullback of globalization is an interesting one. We'll see how permanent it is, uh, but, I, but that's what's leading to the friend shoring and the, and the near shoring and reshoring uh, away from China into other pockets of Southeast Asia or into North America uh, uh, as, as, as a kind of this broader trend that's, that's kind of taking place. Um, as a free marketer, right? Uh, you know, globalization is still a good thing, uh, but you've seen a kind of a retrenchment from globalization in the last few years, which I think is interesting, uh, and hopefully one that we can we can address through you know new trade agreements, et cetera, kind of moving forward. Yeah. Well, I, I think it also explains that in your chart where you saw the employment in the in the manufacturing sector has yeah. been at its all time high, or I think you said twenty or thirty years. Yeah. Um, yeah. So since the Great Recession. Yeah. Yeah. So um, very interesting. Listen, it's been great. I appreciate your time today and all the information. And uh, to the audience, if you have any other questions, please reach out to Chad or, or myself. Uh, appreciate your attendance and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you.